full Max is gone, just thank him and uh, the IK team for having us. It's really been great, we've uh, been welcomed, we've been hosted, we, uh, we feel like uh, part of the IK family, so thank you for that. Um, yes, he said everything already. Um, I'll start with the title, Navigating the Chaos. Um, I've had the question, why is such a rude title? Um, so I thought it was funny, so I'll tell the story. Uh, I was thinking of a title for ADHD and addiction, and uh, I thought of my first uh, contact with somebody with ADHD, and it was in Johannesburg. I was a uh, first year resident in my, uh, my residency training, and I remember a family coming in with a, a six year old boy and um, coming to assess this difficult child. So I thought, you know what I'll do is I'll do what I always do. I'll have my therapeutic uh, interview with the, with the parents. I'll put the child down in the play area and kind of observe from the side what the child's doing. I ended up with the child on the desk grabbing all my pens, the, the parents shouting and screaming, trying to get him off, and me thinking, this is complete chaos. And now, looking back, I thought the, the child was chaotic in the interview, the poor family was very chaotic in the interview, but I was also quite chaotic in my approach, looking back 15 years uh, on my approach then. So since then, a lot has happened, also in ADHD research, uh, for which I'm very grateful, and um, we are continuing at Trial to do research on ADHD and addiction, which has started, so we're very excited about that and we'd like to share a bit of that knowledge with you guys. It's a long talk, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of slides, so um, I would, I'm watching the time. Uh, I'm supposed to watch the time. I'll watch the time, and um, we'll make space for questions at the end, or if there's time in between, uh, I'll let you know. So disclosure, nothing. Uh, if anybody wants to do anything about that. Feel free to contact me. Okay, so the talk is uh, built up in three parts. First part, I want to look at the numbers, what we know from research, um, and just focus a little bit on why they are important, so what, what can we actually do with these numbers, because research is wonderful, but you also have to be able to do something with them, with the, with this, the numbers. Uh, part two, I want to focus a little bit on how does it work, how does ADHD work, and how does it actually work with uh, addiction, um, and how do you assess a patient. And then it builds up to part three uh, on what we can actually do about it, because that's why we're all here, I think, is to be able to treat patients with ADHD and addiction. So if we look at the numbers in general and the comorbidity, um, ADHD, the prevalence of ADHD in children is 7.2% in general, if you look at all studies worldwide. But you also see below, quite a slide, not great today, but below 3 to 12 percent, depending on which article you read. So we also see that a, there are big discrepancies. Um, it really depends on who you ask. But in general, 7.2 percent, the important of that is half of these patients end up as adults with ADHD. And this is quite new, because when I was in training, I remember that ADHD was a disorder of childhood, and we gave patients Ritalin, and then uh, as soon as you're 18, you start the Ritalin, and good luck with that, you yield now. So luckily we know more about that now. And it's got to do a little bit with the, with the uh, myelinization of the frontal cortex. Um, that actually develops until you're 45, not only 25. We always thought that your frontal lobe um, only develops until you are 18, and then you're an adult, and then you can enjoy life and do whatever you want. Now we know, and then we thought 25 is the cutoff, so you actually still until you're 25. Now we know it's actually for 45, your frontal lobe is still developing. So it's actually not that strange that we also have adults now that are still having frontal lobe development. If we then, ooh, that's not good. Um, I'll tell you what the, the, the third one is. If we then look at the prevalence of substance use disorders, I couldn't find any single article on uh, process addictions and ADHD, so if anybody wants to do research, there seems to be a gap in that. Um, if you look at the prevalence of substance use disorders in adults with ADHD, um, we get to 28%. If you turn it around and you think of working in a, if you work in an addiction facility, 23.1% of your patients should have ADHD. So it's almost a quarter of all patients suffering from addiction, or in this case substance use disorders, will have ADHD. But once again, 10 to 25 percent, depending on who you ask. <coughs> um, if we look at the comorbidity of ADHD in children and adolescents, um, 
the important part of this is that it's always a cluster of symptoms. Um, you see, you have uh, obsession, uh, OED, conduct disorder, learning disability, anxiety, and depression is diagnosed in children uh, with ADHD, and it really occurs low. Ah, you can see this one. So I included this slide on ADHD and friends because that's really how it is in, in practice. Um, ADHD in adults occurs with uh, mood disorders and really anything, depression, bipolar mood disorder, mood swings, everything, anxiety disorders, personality disorders, and of course the reason why we are discussing it today, substance use disorders. Quite another alarming fact is if you look at patients with adults with ADHD, 80% of patients with ADHD will have one of these comorbidities, but up to 50% will have two or more of these comorbidities. So it is really a cluster of symptoms. That's also why we get the chaotic feel when we're with these patients, um, because there's really a lot happening as well. I had one patient that um, uh, came from intake, and we couldn't decide whether we were able to treat her or not. And um, she told me that she's a borderline depressive with anxiety disorders, um, this uh, history of post-traumatic stress disorder, and she really wants to die when she's 36, so she must be, you know, she must be borderline. And uh, after my third diagnostic interview, we got to ADHD, and while filling in the list, she started to cry, because that was it. And now she's treated ADHD very successful and for the addiction, and only has two diagnoses. So it really is the, the art and the skill of puzzling where does what fit into this quite intricate puzzle, actually. Okay, this slide, we, you can't really read, it wasn't that well, but I'll explain it quickly. Um, so the literature describes in children what they call pre, um, uh, pre comorbidity, uh, simultaneous comorbidity, and post comorbidity. Um, so, pre comorbidity are the things diagnosed before the diagnosis of ADHD is made. And then you think of things like sleep disturbances in children, you think of autism. Uh, those kind of things. Coinciding with the diagnosis of ADHD, uh, we see also the diagnosis of enuresis, encopresis, uh, and dyslexia. And after the diagnosis of ADHD is made in children, we see the other stuff. Uh, depression, anxiety, OCD, um, chronic disorder, personality disorders, whatever. So the reason I included this slide is because this is the normal way it goes in child psychiatric services. First ADHD kids uh, uh, diagnosed, and then later on, uh, we might get to the other comorbidities. In adults, this is the other way around. We first diagnose people with, you must be depressed, or you must be borderline, or you have to just have this or that, and very rarely, adults get diagnosed with ADHD. So, this is actually a little quiz um, to see what you guys think. Which kind of addictions should we think of in patients with ADHD? Uh, the first one is apparatus or the stimulants. Uh, the second one is the noxious downers, and the last one is all the behavioral ones. Who would we go for the stimulants? Apparatus. Good, very good. The downers, the hypnotics, yes. and behavioral addictions, process addictions. Okay, so the fun things are all right. Everything, really. So, um, the stimulants, of course, that's also what we use to treat ADHD. So amphetamine, um, uh, ritalin is essentially a stimulant as well. Uh, cocaine, caffeine. Um, important to realize here with, with the stimulants that um, patients with ADHD will give a slightly different history of their use of stimulants. They will give you a history that they, get, they become very calm, very focused, that they can work very well. Um, I had a patient that, that told me very nicely that he had a group of people that he used to use with, and he, um, he didn't really like it because they all became very hyper, and talking and chatting and, and in the normal cocaine response, and he just wanted to sit in the corner and chill out. So he was like, almost like he was smoking weed. And he was like, I don't understand what's going on. So then the alarm bell really went ringing in my head um, to test him further. Obviously the hypnotics as well, these patients are very, very busy in their heads, and they want to just have a little bit of rest as well. Um, so the first patient I'll tell you about as well, she used to use coffee on the one side, eating it with a spoon, and an hour later having a glass of wine to kind of balance the chaos really in her head. 
behavioral addictions. This is actually new research from this year, published, published in January. Um, there's been an increase found in internet gaming disorder and social media use uh, in patients with ADHD. And the reason for this is because um, people with ADHD um, have a symptom called hyperfocus. So hyperfocus means that you struggle so much to focus, and when you have that one thing that you can focus on, you love it so much that you actually just do that one thing. So um, that's where that comes from. Oh, this one you can't see at all. Okay, um, if we look at, I don't know if you can see much of it, um, this used to show that uh, if you look at the substances used in ADHD, uh, patients with ADHD have a two and a half times higher risk of abusing substances uh, if compared to patients not having ADHD. And really, I have the purple dots on the control group and the green dots are actually, it's just see that on all levels of all addictions, patients are at high risk of being addicted. So if we then look at uh, the correlation with different demographic features in ADHD, the question arises, what can we do with this knowledge? So does it cor correlate at all? And the first thing that does correlate is early onset of substance use. Uh, patients with ADHD are prone to earlier onset, and as you know, earlier onset of substance abuse have poorer outcomes and is more complex. So there is a link. The second link that was found was higher likelihood of the use of a variety of substances. So not just one, coffee, cocaine, wine, and weed probably. Increased risk of substance use into adulthood has been found in ADHD children and adolescents, uh, which were not treated. Uh, there is a link between the number of symptoms. So the more severe the disorder, but there are 18 symptoms, uh, two clusters of nine, and the, the more symptoms you can take off, literally, in the DSM, uh, the higher the risk of substance use disorders. There is a higher rate of, of uh, ODD and conic disorder, so the behavioral disorders. This is a bit questionable, because we all know that people who are still in active use um, usually have personality disorder traits. So I must be honest, there has been, the link has been found, but it's kind of dubious. Um, another research that is running now is in attention versus hyperactivity type, so which type of ADHD. Um, there's no real link found yet, but they are looking into that. Interestingly enough, where there's no link, gender, male, female, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is with regards to substance use disorders. Age doesn't matter, race, which version, version of the DSM, four, uh, three, four, five, you can use now, doesn't matter. Interestingly enough, I found family history doesn't matter. And if I completely can agree with that, I practice it, okay. Uh, cognitive impairment, executive dysfunction, and family environment was also a shock to me. If you think of the nature versus nurture debate, if you think of uh, the work of Dr. Lander with uh, the generational uh, things and epigenetics, I would doubt this, but this is uh, from a meta-analysis um, like about this. So the question arises, why do we treat ADHD, um, especially in adults? And this is from the British uh, uh, Association of Psychopharmacology. Um, well, obviously, because we can, but it's very costly to society uh, if left untreated. There are high rates of unemployment, a high rate of sick, uh, sick leave, um, there's an association with illicit drug use and alcohol addiction, the reason why we're discussing it today. Um, and there is a lack of academic achievement. So underachievement is a symptom that you will see throughout. The, we'll go through the whole life cycle just now. And that's really like a thread throughout the, throughout the lives of ADHD uh, sufferers. Um, there are also rates of poor social adjustment. Also kind of understandable if you think of how ADHD in children used to be treated. Um, uh, who has treated patients with ADHD, but we were taught uh, to treat patients for school times and after hours they should play. But that's actually not right, because while playing, you also learn, and you learn how to interact, and you learn how to make friends, and how to look for a partner when you're an adolescent. And throughout your life, you also need to be focused and, uh, in those times. But okay, we know better now, so high rates of family and marital conflict, four times increase in criminal convictions, and obviously it's detrimental on the caregivers and the family. It's very, very tough on families. 
um, like it described the first family that I saw, everybody was chaotic. And uh, we ended up treating not only the child, but also the family. And um, our team learned a great deal from that experience. So why do we focus on the addiction part of ADHD? Um, because really, it's a vicious cycle. If you don't treat the one, it will relapse into the other one. So they, they kind of influence the outcomes of each other. And because we have beautiful possibilities to treat them, of course, so why not? Um, I then try to put all of this together and try to get to a list of, list of uh, risk factors uh, from all this data, what we know up to now. And if you, look at, if you think of why people with um, ADHD would become addicted, the first risk factor, I think, would be the associated disorders. We all know that depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorders, sleep disorders, chronic disorders, all those things um, put you at high risk for developing addiction. The second thing is genetic risk. There seems to be a gene uh, for novelty-seeking behavior, and that may predispose individuals to both ADHD and substance abuse. So once again, the old nature versus nurture thing, pops his head out again. Uh, the third thing is impulsivity. Impulsivity is obviously a core symptom of ADHD and addiction. Um, early aggressive behavior the conduct disorder also puts you at risk for later development of antisocial personality disorder and substance use disorders. Stress, cortisol is our stress hormone. And we all know that when the stress hormone goes up, what well, my dopamine goes down, and we search, we seek dopamine. So you can either get it in a healthy way or you can get addicted. Um, and these guys have really a lot of stress with underachievement, poor functioning, relational problems, family problems, you name it. Um, really a lot of problems leading to stress. In that same corner, we look at personal adversity, loneliness, failures, functioning, uh, dysfunctioning, I should have said, um, unemployment. Uh, we know that's also linked to uh, substance use disorders and addiction and relationship problems. Um, relationship problems actually double up because also once your patient is in recovery and the family structure is not also helped, um, we know that this also leads to poor outcomes. I was uh, fortunate enough to do the, the RISE training before this lecture and before the, the, the ICAD and then we learned all about how to help the families through and improving the, the outcomes, um, very important. So, um, if we then look quickly at how does this actually work, and I'm not going to go into all the anatomical things, you might have seen there was an article, I think two weeks ago from the Netherlands, uh, that claimed that people with ADHD have smaller brains that people don't. I'm not going to go into all, all of that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure why that was not but okay. So, I want you to first read these slides and try to imagine for yourself, if you don't have ADHD, um, how it must be to have ADHD. So the first one is picture a room with a thousand TVs, each showing something different. Now try to concentrate on just one TV without getting distracted. So just in your chair and try to do that. It's quite tough, isn't it? There are just three of these, that's a bit of fun. Uh, the second one is, um, someone said it's like being a cat with a hundred people with laser pointers, so everyone with cats will understand how this feels like. And the last one is about the hamster in a wheel in somebody's head, and the hamster runs fast. So this is real, real people describing what it feels like to have ADHD. So this is really the, the, the quick dirty of uh, the pathology principles. Um, it really is a disorder of a deficiency of noradrenaline and dopamine uh, in the prefrontal cortex. There's a lot more to it, but we'll leave it at that. So just a reminder of what the prefrontal cortex does again for us. It helps us with planning and motor activity. It helps us to sustain attention, problem uh, solving and analysis, sustain selective attention as well. It regulates impulses, compuls compulsions and drives. And there's a link through the anterior cingulate cortex to the limbic system, where uh, addiction is also uh, uh, situated, uh, which links this with depression and anxiety. So if we then think, if there's a problem in the prefrontal cortex, then it explains all the symptoms of ADHD. So planning motor activity, if that doesn't work, uh, the planning of that, you get hyperactive. Uh, the attention things, using attention, 
and impulses, impulses come cautious and drives leads to impulsivity. Um, and the recent stuff are really the uh, co-mobility things. So then if we look at the presentation of this throughout the lifespan, then like I just explained before, we used to think it was just a childhood disorder, but now we know this also in adolescents, adults, and actually the elderly as well. So I just want to show you guys a few things. Oops, um, so the normal symptoms that we all know, this is in the DSM as well, I'll read that for you because I can't read that properly. Um, impulsivity, acting before thinking of the consequences, uh, jumping from one activity to the next, disorganization, tendency to interrupt. So as I read this, please try to think of, these, of somebody in your uh, network or environment that acts like this and think how you feel about that person. Um, blurting out things, not waiting one's turn, then we get to the inattention, easily distracted, daydreaming, not finishing tasks, uh, difficulty listening, motor clumsiness, uh, decreased problem solving, lack of initiative and spontaneity, um, losing things, we get to hyperactivity and we see restlessness, uh, fidgeting, climbing, uh, restless sleep, leaving one seat. So yeah. If you think of all of that, you can also think how people react towards these people with ADHD. So the environment is also not very accepting of these kinds of things. So I'm going to take you through the life cycle, and in each part I will just say something about the symptoms, about the symptoms and then also about the consequences and the comorbidities in that phase of life, um, because it differs really per, per phase of life. So the first one is in childhood. We all know this. Um, hyperactivity, impulsivity, inattention is all there. Uh, the frontal lobe is still very undeveloped. Um, myelinization probably just started a little bit. Um, and we get the restless, difficult children that don't want to remain seated. Uh, they fidget, they run, they climb, uh, they blurt out answers if they're in preschool. Uh, we all know these, these, these busy bees. Um, and also inattention, daydreaming, not listening in class, not finishing assignments, working slowly. So needed to say, these guys get into trouble. What happens with this getting into trouble? Um, behavioral disturbances, like I've said, uh, a high uh, number of conduct disorder diagnoses is made. If that is just, I'm not sure. Um, because actually, if you treat the ADHD, you might notice that the uh, behavioral disturbances uh, or the conduct disorder was never to be diagnosed anyway. Um, so ADHD is a lot of times really at the core. Um, they start with academic problems, difficulty in socializing, like I said as well. It's very important to treat these children throughout the whole day because they need to socialize and through play, they learn so much. And low self-esteem, if the whole world tells you that you're a naughty child that's not listening and you're difficult, then this is where the, the self-esteem problems start. So already one can see in childhood how we are priming these, these little patients um, for, and putting them at risk for uh, addiction. So the comorbidities I've said, um, opposition to fines, dis dis disorder, conduct disorder, learning disability, and anxiety and depression. So already in childhood, it leads to problems. Um, just one slide back, childhood. So also important is it used to be the job of the child psychiatrist to diagnose this, but it's actually not like that anymore. Um, teachers, um, parents, uh, social workers, actually everybody working with children you must, must be aware of these symptoms. And as we have evolved throughout the life cycle, more and more people get involved actually in noticing the first symptoms. <coughs> we go to adolescence, I think I don't have to tell you guys how difficult that is. It's the Ericksonian phase of identity versus role confusion, so it's really quite a difficult phase of life already. And then imagine if you have ADHD then. In adolescence, the prefrontal cortex is developed a little bit more, so the hyperactivity seems less in about half the cases, but impulsivity and inattention still there. So the symptoms are similar to childhood, um, but the consequences becomes a little bit more uh, complex. Think of things like academic underachieving now, difficulty socializing again, getting into problems with the law, um, smoking and uh, experimental substance use started at an earlier age. So you have early onset of substance use disorders, which put you at higher risk for polysubstances 
and a poor outcome, and physical injury due to the recklessness. Comorbidity stays the same in this group. Uh, once again, here you might have more counselors getting involved, school counselors, uh, people working with adolescents, uh, youth centers. Um, so there are different people also getting the first signal of something's not right. Next up is adulthood. And there it seems that hyperactivity is really uh, not seen that often. Although I must say in my clinic, about 30% of patients still are hyperactive when I diagnose them. Impulsivity is there. Inattention is the symptom that really stays. And inattention is also the symptom that stays the longest um, and causes the great, the great damage in the end. So inattention in adults, think of procrastination, being late all the time, forgetful, disorganized, making careless mistakes, the hyperfocus I spoke about. Um, hyperactivity, difficulty in relaxing. These, these people are exhausted after a day uh, and they cannot relax. Uh, being restless, excessive talking, difficulty waiting the line, um, engaging excessively in sporting activities, we see that quite often. Because people, uh, adults with ADHD, seem to find a way of coping with it. So sporting is, is actually wonderful if you, if you get running or gymming, or, um, it's a wonderful way to get rid of the energy. Impulsivity is a little more troublesome. Frequently quitting jobs, starting but not finishing multiple projects. Uh, promiscuity, uh, so I think of uh, maybe the, the, the person working at the STD clinic might uh, first see something uh, with ADHD. Uh, outbursts of anger, tiring, oversleeping. Oversleeping is once again, these patients are so tired. I've had a lady that uh, couldn't do group the first two weeks until she was treated for the ADHD and then only she could start with group and only asked you why is she sleeping the whole day. Uh, but it's from one session she's, she's so uh, tired um, afterwards. Excessive talking, interrupting others again. And because patients with ADHD are quite creative and most often very intelligent as well, they're also very enthusiastic to do new tasks. So they kind of overachieve or try to overachieve by doing too much and then actually doing nothing. Uh, also very frustrating. Um, consequences. Uh, academic underachievement, uh, also in work and relationships, so once again the underachievement is there. Uh, increased likelihood of unemployment, increase of absence of sickness, uh, criminal convictions and traffic violations. Once again getting into trouble um, and people not being happy with you. So also, I forgot there is also the self-esteem is there again. So addiction, obviously, and we we'll about that. Mood disorders, generalized anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. Patients can also get into uh, situations that puts, puts them at risk to have something happen and then end up with, P, uh, with PTSD and personality disorders. The elderly, that's a new group for us. Um, I think it's studied in the Netherlands now and I think in Spain and Germany, but really not much known about, about the elderly. You can also imagine if you are in the age group of the elderly and you have ADHD, distinguishing from other cognitive disorders is quite tough, but it's really, if you put it on the life cycle and do a proper biography, you should be able to, to uh, figure out which, which uh, diagnosis is most suitable. But it is a new group that we are uh, examining, uh, and the consequences, similar to adults, except that it's been going on for longer. So the self-medicating, for example, is really a problem because these patients have been self-medicating for so long that they also don't want to change and they might be very addicted to prescription drugs and usually you get referrals um, where, patient, where, where the referrer is quite um, unsure of what the diagnosis is because they've tried something for depression, they've tried something for anxiety and nothing really works and so usually there's a lot of benzodiazepines prescribed just to, to kind of contain things. Um, relationship problems usually these patients are very alone as well. Um, underachievement, financial difficulties, and personal adversity. Addiction, like I said, depression, PTSD, once again, and dementia. So this slide um, really just shows that throughout the different phases, and the slides will be available afterwards. Um, the quality is much better on my Mac, but when against my Mac uh, fault. Um, it's just, I want to show you guys here that in preschool, 
It's really um, more the impulsivity and hyperactivity that we see. In school age, you see everything. Uh, and then as you get older, it's the inattention that stays, the hyperactivity and impulsivity gets less, but the comorbidity, and that's the fine line here, the blue line there, gets more. So the older we get, the more comorbidities we get, and the more complex the comorbidities get. So the, the disorder of ADHD seems to stay the same, but the consequences gets more and more um, intense and, and, and grievous. So if we then look at how we assess uh, and make a diagnosis, it all starts with awareness. And I think, luckily, we are all here, so we are all aware of the problem and that it exists. Because in many countries, it's, there's not even an awareness that it actually can occur in, um, in adults. So it starts with awareness. It's great that you're all here and we are all aware of it. The next step would be screening. After that, we will do the diagnosis. And then it's really important to get the bigger picture. Screening lists, um, I'm not going to go through all of them. We use the colors. Adult ADHD rating scale, they're all validated, they're all great, um, they all list patients can just fill in uh, for themselves. Um, and in our clinic, I'll give an example of what, what we do. Um, uh, we, all, we start with each admission with a screening list. They get it in their packs and within one week get it back. I'll get to that just now. To make a diagnosis, it's important to do a good biographical account throughout the lifespan, to look at all these phases and um, it was always taught that you have to have a collateral history as well. Not really necessary if you have an adult who really know a lot about the childhood still, that should be enough, that could be enough to make the diagnosis. Obviously, if you have a parent or uh, a caregiver to give an account, also wonderful, great. Uh, next up is an account of all the parents. People in adults, there's been a decrease in the number of symptoms. It used to be six out of nine. Uh, in both clusters, or one of the, the clusters, now it's five. Um, literature also suggests four even, so it's not the number of symptoms you have, but also the disability that it causes um, across two life domains. Um, a careful co assessment of the comorbidity, focusing on other frequently occurring uh, disorders, which we just spoke about, a full history of psychiatric and somatic treatments, um, a full history of psychiatric and neurological problems, uh, additional psychological problems, think of the, uh, the self-esteem, the social integration, the coping mechanisms, and full addiction history. In your addiction history, um, we spoke about this, look at these are the, the commonly occurring uh, addictions that we, we think of, alcohol, cannabis, uh, also stimulus, cocaine, uh, speed, uh, methylphenidate, also medication misuse, we'll get to that just now, and incident gang disorder, and addictive use of social media, which is not in the DSM-5 yet, but soon to come. The diagnostic tool that we use in the Netherlands is called the DIVA. I do not think of the name, but I quite like it. It's the Diagnostic Interview for Adults with ADHD. V is for Vassene in Dutch. So um, this has been developed in the Netherlands. And actually what it is, is it's a list of all the symptoms of the uh, DSM listed with examples in childhood and examples in adulthood. So it's quite nice. Sorry, uh, question. There is increased evidence of uh, gaming disorder, right? Uh, is there any increased incidence of gambling? Uh, the, um, I couldn't find any articles on gaming, but I can, I can imagine. Yes. I think it's about that hyper-focus, um, finding something like a slot machine or, you know, which we have a lot of online gamers, uh, gamblers in our clinic. So I can, I can imagine, yes, yes. Thanks. Welcome. Um, so the Diva we use, what's, what's really great about this, this is the app. It's available in the App Store. Uh, I think it's Town or something here. It's available in 27 different languages. So it can also be in the language of the country that you work or the language that you, you work in. And what's really great about this is you can use this list to fill in with the patient because there's about five or six examples per, per symptom uh, which you can just tick off. And I do it with the patient. So I sit next to them, I fill this in. And this works very well for getting patients compliant as well. Um, and also, everything is there. So once you take everything off, uh, you kind of have an idea. But like I said, you also have to do the history and the biographical account. This just makes it kind of easier. And it's also it's the start of the therapeutic alliance in this. I always use the biopsychosocial approach, uh, which I also I do this with patients. I actually have a table that I fill in with patients. 
and look at all the biological, psychological, and social uh, features of the disorder and everything there. So biological, these are just things that I jotted down. Uh, think of the gen genetic predisposition, every patient has that. Think of all the physical developmental things, intelligence, temperament, medical comorbidities maybe. Uh, maybe comorbidities from years of substance abuse. So put that on, on the one side. In the middle we have psychological things. Think of things like the personality structure, the self-esteem, insights, defenses, uh, patterns of cognition, responses to stresses, trauma history, coping strategies. If you think of what we just spoke about, there's a lot there usually. Social, look at the peer, peers, the family constellation, work environment, ethnic influences as well. I don't know if you work in a country of different, of, with somebody of different ethnicity, take that into account, write that down, um, discuss it with your patients. Socioeconomic issues, culture, religion. So once you have this, this is quite flat, I find. We use the dynamic formulation after that, and we start in the middle with the problem list. So this is a way to conceptualize the psychiatrists. Some psychologists people will probably know about this. Um, we use this to, uh, to, to uh, get a patient to have an idea of how the different pieces fit together. To start off with the problem list, I let the patient fill that in for themselves. What are the problems that you experience? Then we look at the predisposing factors. So what may be vulnerable in the first place? Is it genetics? Is it my, the environment that I'm from? Um, you know, think what's happening with the patient and guide them through this. Then we look at the precipitating factors. So what made me come to the doctor now, or to the psychologist now, or what made me uh, seek help now? Um, very interesting for patients to, to have that. Then we look at perpetuating factors on the left, on the right. Um, so what keeps these problems from going on, and what keeps me from recovery? So why am I, do I keep on um, getting relapses? And then we get the protective factors. So what is actually positive? What, what do I have going for me? Where do I have, do I have a good family structure supporting me? Or I have a good job? Or uh, loving parents? So we do this with patients and we give it to them to also look at during their recovery. And we do it for addiction, we do it for ADHD, we do it for depression, for whatever they come with. It's a very helpful tool. Okay, so now we've got the diagnosis. We know what's going on. We have the bigger picture. What to do? Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, what about uh, when you do the diagnosis? Do you require that the patient has been drug free for a while before starting the evaluation? Not always. Okay. Not always. If you can get because ADHD is a lifespan diagnosis, if you can get a proper history of how a person has been in other periods of abstinence, that's enough. I mean, obviously, once we get to the to the treatment, I'll show you guys as well. We get patients to be absent first, so we detox them first, and then after the detox, we start treating. So for treatment, it's necessary to be to be clean, but sometimes you just can't get somebody to be clean before you start treating, and then you have to just go in and do it. But then I would suggest to do it in a clinical setting where it's safe and patients can be monitored. Okay, because I I meet some young patients. Yes. Uh, with a very chaotic lifestyle and lots of drugs, yes. and they really, really want to get the ADHD diagnosis, and their parents are saying no, there was no signs of ADHD in their younger years. Yes. So how would you handle a, a, a story that doesn't match? Then I would probably then you have to look at your clinical picture. So then I would probably want the patients to be clean first. Mm to observe yourself, then it's probably necessary, yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, so treatment of an approach, biopsychosocial approach, obviously, and I'll show you an example of how we do it. Um, and we're also still learning, and uh, I hope you guys have good feedback for me um, on how we can do it even better. So let's dive into the medication. It's quite controversial, and um, I think I'm being quite brave talking about it, but uh, let's see how this goes. So the medication is really not that difficult. You have the stimulants, you have the non-stimulants and the antidepressants. So the stimulants, um, methylphenidate, um, amphetamine, dexamphetamine, uh, sorry, dex, dex and list dex, dexamphetamine is a long-acting um, amphetamine. Those are the stimulants, they work on dopamine and noradrenaline. And then the non-stimulants, antimoxetine is the NRI, so it only works in the noradrenaline. And guanfacine is a new one, also noradrenergic 
and antidepressants, it depends on which guideline you read. Uh, in some countries, they advise even the vaccine, uh, most countries not. Um, I've also read that people use tricyclic antidepressants. Anything that works on the neuroadrenergic system can also help. But really, it boils down to these four drugs. And guanfacine, I don't know if that's available here for ADHD or when you guys work, it's available. Okay. It's quite new in the Netherlands. I've actually never prescribed, but uh, I got the letter two weeks ago, but we can use it now as well. So if we just look at this, we're going to do the this too much. Like I said, in this slide, it's just that the stimulants work on your noradrenaline and your dopamine, and that's where the abuse potential comes from. Whereas the noradrenaline-specific drugs uh, don't, so it's not seem <laughs> safe to use in uh, patients with addiction. This slide is a great uh, thing that I just stole from the BAP guidelines, the British Association of Psychopharmacology. I love this slide because it shows you that the efficacy in the middle is actually the same, whichever drug you use. Um, if you look at adverse events, they're quite similar. But if you look at the atomoxetine, the disadvantage is that it's got a slow onset of uh, effect, which is a problem. I mean, it takes about four to six weeks for your patients to really see the effect of it. But it is safe in addiction, so you, you cannot, uh, there's no street value to it. Disadvantages of the stimulants are abuse potential. So to talk about the addiction potential, the question that I often get when I do this talk is does treating children with stimulants cause addiction? And the answer quite simply is no, it doesn't. Um, there's been 11 studies looking at this. Uh, seven studies, so what these studies do is what you actually want to know is you have to look at adolescents and adults that have been treated uh, with stimulants. That's what they looked at. So that's actually what you want to know. I mean, there are a lot of studies, but these studies are important. So seven out of 10, 11 uh, from these studies showed reduced risk for substance abuse later in life. Three showed no difference at all. And one dubious study showed a small increase. So putting that all together, the consensus on this is that treating ADHD in ch children does actually decrease the risk for substance abuse later in life. Sorry, the, the studies that showed a reduced risk of substance abuse, uh, did that include uh, uh, amphetamines, uh, prescribed uh, amphetamines as well? Sorry, I think the... Uh, did, you know, the substance abuse yeah. later in life, did that include prescribed amphetamines as well? Um, it was only on methylphenidate, not amphetamine. Yeah, it was only the methylphenidate, yeah. <coughs> Yeah, there's actually very little data on um, prescribing uh, dexamphetamine in early life. Not much to be found, actually. Thank you. So, once again, misuse potential. That's another question I often get. So, uh, you prescribe stimulants to your patient for Ritalin. Obviously, they all just abuse that, their drugs. That's why I get asked. Um, not true. We prescribe a lot of stimulants to the patients and you have to talk to your patients about it. Um, it's not completely uh, unacceptable to prescribe stimulants. It's still a very good treatment. Uh, Sandra Koy is my colleague that works at the Service Excellence Center for ADHD in Europe, and she actually says that patients with addiction and ADHD are uh, the most, uh, uh, the group that needs treatment the most, um, and they also need the best treatment and also the soonest they need treatment. So we really need to treat them with whatever works. So, um, we use that non stimulants so obviously not has no abuse potential. Um, uh, with the stimulants, uh, I'll show you the next slide that's important. So this is a study by Nora Valpolko uh, that she did with methylphenidate and cocaine, where she injected uh, patients, cocaine users, with um, cocaine and then later with methylphenidate. And what we see here in the red curve is on the, on the left hand side cocaine, and we see the spike, and that's why. Uh, that's the, the, the uh, saturation in striatum. And you see with methylphenidate, it's a much slower decrease at the end. So the, the uh, elimination is much slower in methylphenidate. The blue line is the experience of the patient. And what's interesting, if you read this study, is that they concluded that the, the patients that were addicted to cocaine actually did not experience uh, a drug kick from the methylphenidate. So, and this is normal, normal methylphenidate, not the medium or long-acting one. Um, yes, I'm just putting it out there. Um, 
Another question that I get asked quite frequently is, is it not so with replacement therapy? If you have somebody addicted to cocaine with ADHD and you give him Ritalin, is it not just like giving methadone, methadone to somebody with heroin? I think that's a great question. And the answer is actually no. Um, but then you need all the stuff that we just discussed, a proper diagnosis made, and then you should know what you are treating. Um, also, uh, patients with ADHD will not get the high from methylphenidate, they will actually be calmer. So the clinical, clinically it's quite different, but it's a great question, I mean, it's, there's something to say for that. And I also have patients that have used uh, written methylphenidate, and they've asked me to please never prescribe again, because they do get that high and that drug-seeking behavior, and that people even get cravings um, from it. So then it's quite easy. We just go back to atomoxetine or one of the noadrenergic drugs, and that was just as well. But you need some time for it to work. Can I just ask a question? Yes. If you can give ADHD sufferers drugs that aren't stimulants that don't have the possibility of becoming addictive, why do you use them? Why not use the one, use the other one? It's got to do a little bit with the patient's observation. Um, People want the direct effects. So, with there's also the correlation, isn't there? If you're giving people drugs at an early age, then there's more chance of them becoming um, the addicted to them or, or in any. No, no, no. There's less chance. So, if you treat if you treat children with methylphenidate with mm -hmm. stimulants, there's a smaller risk, but there's, there's lower risk for becoming addicted later in life. Mm -hmm. Eight is yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Of course. Yeah, my colleague Sandra Coy, I've discussed it with her, and she says that they believe that the, the Asia Center in The Hague, where I work, that uh, methylphenidate is still superior to atomoxetine. If you look at the research, and the research is also done by, uh, by, uh, the, uh, uh, by the company that makes atomoxetine, so you can ask yourself well, exactly. the time. <laughs> There's always something to say for, but... Um, There's only 11 studies, mm. and then exactly. Yeah, exactly. But on the other hand, the patient must have it better, getting treated. So there's always talk about they are in more risk to take drugs uh, later on. But this, that can also be done who is not treated. You know, it, it's mm. always about the right medicine and something. So. Yeah. And, some, and some people, I mean, one, one side effect, for example, with atomoxetine is getting nauseous. And I have a lot of patients that, that get very nauseous on the drug. I uh, also have patients that need to be treated really quite acutely. So another approach could be to start with methylphenidate and then later on switch to um, atomoxetine. I've done that quite, quite often to start both together as well. So you start with methylphenidate until you get the right dose. Then you also add atomoxetine and six weeks later the atomoxetine is, is active and then you can start the stimulant. That's also quite common actually to do. And that's actually for me, that's the best approach because I agree. Why take the risk of somebody? Because if somebody gets relapse and starts selling the, the written form, you know, it's got street value as well. Yeah. Let's be honest. It is, yes. So in a, uh, I work at an adult ADHD clinic at Mosley Hospital, so it's the major problem with that is anxiety. It causes anxiety. It causes anxiety. So this would be called, kind of like I said, I can't take this. Then you, the problem with anxiety and conservative methylphenidate Do you guys also use, um, I'm drifting off my lecture, but do you guys also use uh, dexamphetamine, less dexamphetamine for patients that are suffering from addiction? At the moment? Yeah. Yeah, great, yeah. We've also been doing that for quite long, but we get a lot of critiques on that. So. We do, we do. Okay, great. And that choice, that's a short act. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I wonder about non-pharmacological things, like you know, feedback. We're getting there. Okay. Yeah. Just if, if they were um, studies showing benefits and meditation. We're getting to the non-pharmacological things just now. Yeah. What about the remark of the manufacturer of these medications that it should be looked at very critical in people with addiction? 
in all the leaflets and all the uh, and should it should uh, it is more, that's a good I think the next slide is actually that uh, no it's three slides we're getting there we're getting there but it's, it's all about discussing the, the risks and benefits with your patients absolutely so just shortly the consensus guidelines say that um, and I think this is actually from Walsley, um <coughs> that stimulants are still the first line treatment in adults with ADHD. Antimoxetine is considered the first line treatment in patients with substance use disorders, so it's in the guidelines. Uh, careful titration and monitoring of the side effects uh, are required. Um, drug treatment should be continued as long as clinically useful. So this is also a, a, a question I get often is how long should you treat patients? It's forever? No. Uh, you take drug holidays, and drug holidays is not like we've been taught always. Um, that if a child goes on holiday, he doesn't have to take his ADHD, he doesn't have to take his ADHD medication. It's you discuss with the patient in six months' time, time we're going to have a week where we are not going to give you medication, and we're going to see how it goes, because you also outgrow it, and it's not always necessary to treat lifelong. So drug holiday as well, and what I just spoke about co-administration of the medicines um, is also relatively common in clinical practice. Groups and NICE guidelines. Um, the drug treatment is based on the cohort conditions, tolerability versus uh, adverse effects, uh, as the college has commented on. Uh, the convenience of dosing, potential for abuse, obviously, and the patient or the parent uh, preference. Um, I think I missed this one. Ah, yes. So that was the answer to your question, Mac. Um, so if you do prescribe stimulants, um, you, the, it's advised to use the long-acting uh, preparations. That's preferred. Um, discuss the abuse potential with your patient. Um, it's really about the therapeutic reliance as well as how much you trust uh, the patient. Um, involve the family as well. And this is a family problem as well. So involve the family. Medication can be taken under supervision, for example. Um, and have a clear treatment plan. You can also prescribe weekly, for example. So if you do get to the point where a patient is very anxious and he doesn't want to take atomoxetine and you have to end up uh, prescribing stimulants, then these are kind of things to still keep it safe. I don't know if that answers the question at the back. Okay, then the non-pharmaceutical uh, options. The top one, which you can't see, is coaching and CBT. Uh, Psychoeducation, exercise and diet, um, and I'm going to discuss a few things. The first thing is that in, I'm just going to go through this whole slide, but in preschool children, um, it's more parent training that you will do later on, you will do classroom interventions to try to structure the, the world around the patient. But as we get older, um, it's advised to do cognitive behavior therapy, and even DBT is advised. Um, we do cognitive behavior therapy if necessary, um, but that's part of our bigger program. Coaching topics <coughs> uh, could be to talk to your patients about acceptance of the disorder, uh, learning to deal uh, with time management, uh, learning to limit activities to one goal at a time. Um, we actually sometimes buy um, agendas for patients and have them have a day schedule of what they're going to do today, just to structure things in the beginning, organizing home and administration finances, uh, dealing with relationship and work difficulties, uh, learning to initiate and complete tasks, and understanding emotional responses associated with ADHD. So For example? Sorry? For example, the emotional responses associated with ADHD. Would be well, well, blurting things out, or those kind of impulsivity things, or um, we talk a lot about um, self-esteem, for example, for doing things to something and having regrets for I did it again. Those kind of topics. Yeah. Uh, not good. So psychoeducation can be individual, it can be in group, it can be supported, it can be didactic. Um, there are culturally adapted um, psychoeducation programs. Um, we have in our clinic a support group that's also a little bit didactic, uh, very informative actually. Um, so there are different models of, of doing this. 
um, we do then. So the treatment sequencing um, it, with all these disorders together used to be uh, sequential and I'm not going to stick to this, so it's got sequential means that it was always thought to treat the substance use disorder first and that was in the time that they thought that a detox was a treatment. Um, then you treat the mood disorder, then the anxiety, then the ADHD and maybe one day will treat your nicotine addiction or not. And the problem with this approach is that usually with adults it stops with anxiety disorders People forget that maybe it's, there's also ADHD there. Um, the other problem with this is in children we start with ADHD and we never look back and we don't even think that children can also be addicted. I heard this morning uh, in the lecture of the Hayes that uh, she's even treated a patient of eight years that was cocaine addicted. So even in child psychiatry we have to remember that addiction is a problem. So this doesn't work because of the relapse. So integrative, uh, treat, integrated treatment. I'm sure you all know much more about it than me. Um, but you have to treat everything together. So what we do is we do detox first, and then we look at the other stuff. And I'm going to show you just now, um, you can skip to this. Everybody knows the motivational cycle. Um, I'm not going to talk about addiction treatments now. You all know that much better as well. So what we do in our clinic, just for a, an example of what you could do with all this information. So we start off with, uh, before, after the intake, we do a detox. And on the day of admission, patients get the screening list. Second step is we start the substance use disorder uh, treatment, which is our model. You're all welcome downstairs to come and learn about that. We're not going to do that here. And you see the doctor, psychotherapist, whoever is going to do the diagnostics. Then we do the diagnostics, we do the diva list, and we do a full psychiatric uh, interview and diagnosis. After that, if the ADHD screening and Diagnosis, the ADHD diagnosis is made actually, we start treatment. Um, patients start with ADHD group, and the group is a weekly group for four weeks in patients, what we do. Um, and we're going to start an outpatient group soon, um, because this is very valuable for patients. And like I said, it's, it's, it's half of the group, the first half is very informative, and the second half of the, the group is just sharing ideas, sharing experiences. It's really more about sharing and supporting each other. Um, then during your admissions, while the ADHD is stable, we look at the other comorbidities, the anxiety, depression, whatever else is left. And it's advised um, to treat um, first what the patient uh, is suffering from. So if the patient is suffering from anxiety, then focus on anxiety first, if you have to make a choice. Because even in an integrated uh, approach, there's still sequential uh, steps to be taken. And obviously weekly follow-ups by the therapist, doctor, uh, also to check the medication, and we have cell screening lists to, to see how the symptoms are improving. So this is our approach. So the last two slides, and then we'll round up. Um, challenges in the, in the treatment for us, anyway, is that the initial diagnosis might be very complex. Underdiagnosis or even overdiagnosis is really a problem. Um, people need to be trained to diagnose uh, ADHD addiction. Uh, overall, under treating as well. Um, some people are scared of the high doses that are sometimes needed. Um, and then in the drug holidays, uh, withdrawal symptoms is always a concern, of course. And side effects of the medication, and you can say anxiety with hypnosis, for example, other things. Uh, non compliance, stigma. Um, I don't know if how it is in other countries, but in the Netherlands, it should still a stigma about having ADHD. Um, relapse of the addiction uh, also sets patients back. Uh, depression and post ADHD stabilization is really a problem. Uh, we have many patients that have been addicted for long um, and then they come to us. I had one patient that was 42 years old and we stabilized him and he was very happy and he came to me and he started to cry and he said, Look at me. And I was like, Yes, but what am I supposed to see? And he said, I'm 42 years old but I'm dressed like a 14 year old. And he kind of just missed everything from 14 to 42. And it was very sad. And we had a treating for actually a real full of depression afterwards. Um, it was quite traumatic for him to get the diagnosis. So it's, it's, it's really an on ongoing process as well. Um, and of course, the misuse of prescribed medication is a big problem. Um, and it remains a problem. So just to conclude, um, common things occur commonly, I think. That's the main message. This is a common thing. 
So we're all aware now, so please don't miss it. Um, ADHD often has friends, so please look for them, the other diagnoses. Um, the diagnosis is complicated, but it's not impossible. Uh, it could be straightforward if you just follow the steps. Um, treatment is available, it could be very rewarding. Uh, integrated treatment is really key in relapse prevention as well. And use everything you have. Um, you know, com combine medication groups, psychoeducation, uh, I just heard yoga and uh, things in the air. I mean, there are all sorts of things that can help. And um, use everything you have. And involve the family. This is really also, it's not only a diagnosis of the individual, but also of the family and support structure. We need all of that. So I would like to thank you. That's what I've got. I'm also available downstairs today, school tomorrow. So if you have questions or comments, please uh, feel free. But, uh, thank you very much. Uh, do we have a microphone? Uh, yeah, that's so nice. My name's Brian, I work with lots of um, children, uh, adolescents, adults with ADHD. Uh, well, I come from a new era myself. And, I'm sort of self-diagnosing and listening. Every time I do all of this diagnosing, I just, it's a very dangerous thing, is that I tick all the boxes myself. And I've never had any treatment for this. Um, I come from an era where it didn't even exist, so the terminology didn't exist. However, I can remember very clearly the sense of our class and our school and um, our systems were, it's pretty obvious that they were sufferers. And I was one, but I was also a school champion in sport, so you hit them out right on the head. I was threatened to be thrown out of school regularly, except Brian is in this team, that team, that team, so we're going to keep yeah, him on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My point around this though is that, you know, I get very nervous. Um, with, with, with addiction, I've really learned something here today. It makes so much sense, something was said today that I have to almost apologize for having a different league yesterday, that it, it's become obvious to me, if you treat it young enough and appropriately, you actually, you, you're not sending someone into addiction. Mm -hmm. And out there and in our industry, the rhetoric is the opposite. Exactly. And on television, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. in Australia where I worked for many years, oh, there's kids on Ritalin, thank God we got them all off it, they were all turned into junkies. Yeah, and, and in doing so, they didn't treat children who needed treatment and didn't become so, junkies. So all the consequences yeah. escalated. Yeah. And, and that's in this industry, across the board actually, in various areas, it's that thing, a little bit of information is a dangerous thing. And um, so I, I'm still not so old to go and get diagnosed myself instead of me diagnosing myself. But um, I, I do struggle with the ones who all are already addicted to other substances, but they're displaying obvious problems. You know? yeah. Yeah. And, and I do struggle with that. And, and, and then it, do I detox them first? Do I do that? And, um, it's also that I find the families very difficult to work with at times. You said involve the family. Families seem to want to pass the problem on to us. This is our job. Uh, at present in London, anyway, for me, I'm finding more families. So thank God, take the problem away and sort Fred. You know, and um, it doesn't work that way. You know, we have to get all the family involved and understand something that I didn't believe once existed. I'm just being honest with that. I'm in the old school in the old days. This song just invented this. Yeah. Now I believe it is true and we should treat it as young as possible.
brilliant idea. So uh, I've really enjoyed your um, take on it. Thank you. And I'm glad to hear the science and research being carried out and may continue. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, another thing that you said is, is in the family, you also have undiagnosed ADHD. Yeah. So in the family, I, we also get that down in the patient of your problem. And thank you for sending me a healthy relative later. We also get that. If you work with the family, if you also see the family, you will, you might diagnose undiagnosed ADHD. There's a tough for families to accept. Absolutely. Yes. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Um, my question is really all to talk about younger people with ADHD because I used to facilitate emotional support groups in schools and a lot of the kids that were brought into these groups had ADHD but what I also noticed from that and one to one counselling with them is that they'd all experienced trauma I, I missed the beginning of the session so I don't know if I missed out on something there but I'm wondering what your experience is regarding the correlation between trauma and ADHD? Well, I think there's also a correlation between trauma and addiction. I think the, the ADHD, yeah, trauma, yeah. The addiction thing, there's also part of a cluster of, of things together. And I think it's actually, it's true. Yeah, I, mean that, I think in the adolescent slide, I had that. I'm not sure when you enter. Um, but what happens is, as we get older, so from children, from childhood to adolescence, um, patients get more daring, if you want. So they do more dangerous things, they get more into trouble, and the more they get into trouble, they can also get themselves into situations where they can have traumatic events and have actual PTSD. So that, I mean, that's quite extreme, but I believe this is all sorts of the small little traumas. It's not like a trauma with a capital yeah, into PTSD, but the small traumas obviously is. Yeah. We almost always see that. Absolutely, right. absolutely. Is it chicken or egg? Yeah, well that's what I wanted to know, because this is pre-addiction. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's actually, it's actually the, the ADHD causing the chaos, causing the, the trauma, leading to the addiction. That's kind of the... No, that's, uh, no. I think the ADHD is at the, at the, at the core of it. If you're born in a family with ADHD parents, you're more likely to be subjected to verbal and physical abuse. Okay. So your, your parents, or one of two, is more likely to be short tempered <coughs> have poor self esteem, have grown up with problems, self, have not been able to regulate impulsive behavior. So when we miss the diagnosis of a child or an adolescent with ADHD, even an adult, we are really missing the opportunity to prevent verbal, physical abuse and all the consequences. I just want to say in this country we recognise ADHD, um, but stimulants are still in the BNF, the British National Formulary, you can only prescribe for children. So the moment they turn 18, you can still prescribe, but uh, it's off label. So and that causes a lot of problems because they come to specialists, you diagnose them, then you ask the GP to carry on and prescribing and a shack agreement. And most of the GP, in my experience, about 70% of them, 8%, will say, no, I will not continue. So here you have someone who's got, does need to have it, medications, life improves, etc., but they cannot afford it. Uh, so very expensive uh, medications and I, that's a major problem, is a matter is a matter of budget. The second, in UK, the medical profession has not been trained to recognise ADHD and to treat, just like autism. Um, and it's, it's cultural, I mean, but ADHD was described for the first time in 1797 by a Scottish um, a psychiatrist. So, just and that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> so <we're> totally bad. <laughs> now we know it is. Yes. yes. Yeah, absolutely. We have in the Netherlands. We're lucky because uh, stimulants are actually uh, can be prescribed and are paid for in adults. But we have a similar problem with the last team. The patients have to pay themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just, I just, I just want to say one more thing because yeah, I sure. think we have to compare ourselves with the US and just going back to what we were saying. 
we have to acknowledge that there is a problem with uh, diagnosing people that actually don't have, uh, if you go to California, the prevalence of ADHD or misdiagnosed mystery is very high. They use Agile, which is a mix of um, this dexamphetamine and, uh, and, and amphetamine, pure amphetamine, which does cause a lot of uh, um, withdrawal symptoms and addiction. And the third thing is that in the United States is, is overprescribed, mm -hmm. so just for as a country enhancer. So I think, you know, I come from Italy where ADHD doesn't exist. You go to US and you bump into ADHD uh, every other person. I think we have to find uh, the right balance. Um, and it depends where you are in Europe. You know, some some countries have struck that balance and others still are struggling. You see that you see that in the in the guidelines as well, if you compare um, mostly to the BIP guidelines, to the to the Dutch guidelines, to, every country has a different guideline as well. So I think that's really the biggest thing we have to get to that point where everybody has the same thing and it's recognized everywhere. So one question for you, eating addiction. In my experience, a lot of people with eating disorder uh, would actually do brilliantly on stimulants. Um, or they are actually find it that binge eating um, to control, they find it a uh, better control for the better binge eating. So uh, that's like one of the major indications at the moment when someone's got eating addictions. And uh, I, you have a mention that you don't want to eat a stimulant. Sorry? Isn't that because it's a stimulant and you don't want to eat a stimulant? No, it's not only about that, it's about sense of control. Yes. And learning, say, use stimulants like cutting, etc., that gives control and cravings for sugars. So it's, it's very complex, but I, I just want to be able We to have no experience now, that's why I was doing it. <laughs> so I'll look into that. I'll add that to the list. Thanks, yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions, comments at the back? Oh, you have the sorry. Hi, um, Laura Morrison, Salutum Health. We work with workplace behavioral health. One of the things I'm seeing an increasing trend for is more and more adults, and particularly women, getting adult diagnoses of ADHD. Now, obviously, at that point, they've not been, you know, treated. What are your thoughts on the role with the employer in working with them towards strengths-based recovery and looking at what that individual's assets are because they have maintained a stable life and had well, relative I think, success? I think if it's, if it's, if it's possible, um, if you have the privacy of, of information, you have to cover that, of course. But if you can get, I mean, just like involving the family, I think if you can involve the, the employer, why not? I think absolutely, yeah, great, great to do that, yeah. And the interesting thing with women, I didn't put that inside either, but um, it said that women um, uh, have a lower, lower prevalence of ADHD than men. So in boys and girls, about uh, four, uh, four to one, and males, two to one. I question that, I question that. That's, that's, yeah. In the UK, in the UK, we have a, a government initiative. It's called Access to Work. Mm -hmm. Allows you up to two thousand grants to apply. And ADHD is included as a disability or autism yeah. ADHD. What allows you to do is to ask for a budget money to access to work. You have to be an auto retaining person. If you're struggling, you want a coach or ADHD coach or whatever. <coughs> different laptop or different digital devices that would allow you um, to ask for that, so, so access to work. Great, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. One more question. Yeah, this, um, I, I recognize what the gentleman was saying there in terms of the diagnosis in the professional field. I work uh, for a small charity and we work with homeless people who come into what we would describe as a therapeutic community. Okay. So I just want to ask a question. Um, what is the effectiveness of non-pharmacological approaches to ADHD in terms of uh, people living in a community and being uh, gently challenged on their behavior and being given uh, cognitive uh, skills and care and attention for, for with us over a year sometimes? And what are your views of the effectiveness of that? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's also part of the, the life cycle approach. As we get older, 
obviously you, you unlearn the behaviors or you grow out of it or with the frontal lobe, you know, like the ADHD would also decrease over time. That could be part of it. Uh, the thing with the non pharmaceutical things is they're just not well studied yet. There's not a lot of research on it. So I think the guidelines go towards that pharmacological treatments are the main way of treating them. I think you would agree with that. Um, and the other stuff has, has not been, yet been uh, uh, studied that well. So it's not evidence based, but like I said, use everything that you can. I think um, treat people with medication and do the environmental things and the workplace and the family. And the more things, you, things and people you include in treating, and the longer you stay with the patient and help the patient through their journey, the better the outcome really is. So also, depend whether it's that you intend that. Do you intend to use it as a first line treatment? It's much less effective than a second line treatment. Yes. Most of these patients come to you in a crisis. Um, um, they want a quick fix. I mean, they, they have patients. If you propose CBT, is it 10 sessions at least? They have to go home, concentrate on homework. <laughs> it's it's practically very difficult for them. The response to medications is the day after, I mean, an hour after you take it uh, immediately. So with that, it comes with a, uh, you, you kind of, a, they, they, they rely on you, they come to with a lot of skepticism to you, as they are, I have the ADHD or not, what do you think? And then you, here, here they come to you and you propose something that will take weeks. There's no way they're gonna, unless, you know, my, in my experience, yeah. I have one in a, in a hundred that will, go down that way and, and, and prefer the non-pharmacological. It's very, yeah. and also to find someone who's very good, who's been trained in reality, yeah. it's tough in this country. Anybody, I don't know anybody, anybody, whether yes. in the Netherlands, yeah. it's more expensive. It's actually, sorry, I'm interrupting you, but it's yeah. actually quite rewarding to, to treat these patients because you see the effects immediately. It's almost like giving paracetamol. Uh, in psychiatry, we have very little, or very few, uh, things to really treat that way. You know, usually you have to wait for weeks and weeks and weeks for anything to work. <laughs> and with ADHD, it's really great because you treat, you see the effects, the patient is happy, and then they start working on the secondary treatments to get the rest in place. And that's where they, they stabilize further. That's where the, the rest of the magic happens if you want. So, so, yeah. Hi. One last question, and I think we have to stop. Um, I work for a company in Canada um, surrounding. Uh, conversations about ending the stigma around mental health. And I'm just curious on um, what you think uh, would be something that we can implement better to um, help end the stigma. Well, I think it all starts with what we're doing here. We're talking about it mm -hmm. and getting the message out. Uh, you know, I also have I've done this talk in countries where uh, it's really still seen as a disorder of childhood and not even adolescence. So I think it's got, you know, the more information you put out there, and when we talk about this, I think this is the, the biggest step you can actually do um, to get rid of the stigma. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.